We are going to do that today with the United States Women's National Team and the 2022 calendar year. We've, we're going to go chronologically, but we're really going to uh, probably take deeper dives onto things that uh, – really kind of stood out for us with, you know, in terms of covering this team in 2022. So, you know, there's no better place to start than at the top. Uh, this team, you know, started out their, uh, their 2022 with their, uh, you know, annual January camp it was a little different in the sense where it wasn't a big, big, massive kind of ID type of camp. It was still kind of roughly around, I believe it was like 23 to 26 players. Mm -hmm. um, and But this camp didn't have any uh, friendlies attached to it. It was just an extensive camp for players to sort of get back into the mix uh, with each other. And we already know that that's going to be different in 2023 because U.S. Soccer said, yes, there's going to be the January camp. It is going to take place in New Zealand. And there are going to be not one, but two friendlies. And it is going to be against the co-host nation of New Zealand. So already a little bit of different energy from 2022 to 2023. But I think because of that, knowing that there were just going to be the, there was just going to be the camp that made us a little bit more excited for something like Shiba right. Cup, which ended up taking place in like you know February March. Yeah, I mean, I think it, the difference between last year and this year already is because in 2023 the team is preparing for a World Cup, um, as is everyone else, as are we. But She Believes Cup last year happened um, in February, like it usually did in Carson and in Frisco, Texas and, and California. Um, and it featured Iceland, Czech Republic and New Zealand. The United States won it. It was their fifth. She believes cup title, but it, if you remember Sandra, they didn't start out maybe as strong and as dominant as fans would have liked. It was a zero, zero, nil, nil Czech Republic draw at, to start this she believes cup for the United States. They then go on to smack New Zealand five nil and then smack Iceland five nil. We had a, a lot of different goal scorers, Mallory Pugh. Um, I believe she had four in this or three in this. She had a couple of braces in a game and the game against Iceland, Christine Ewis got on the board. We saw Katarina Macario score goals. Um, Ashley Hatch was, was also part of this roster for She Believes Cup. But this was also the start of, from the January camp to the She Believes Cup, the start of where we saw a lot of consistency from Black Oenanovsky about the types of players that he was going to bring into these rosters. Um, at leaning a little bit more towards some newer players in, in Hatch and getting Mallory Pugh back into the swing of things and Sophia Smith. And, and this was when he turned a page and and open people up to the idea of the consistency that would be throughout this year. Yeah. We definitely talked a lot about um, sort of those next gen players, right? The players who are, you know, that we're going to likely be covering and, and, and speaking about, you know, in, in the next decade in, in front of us. Um, and that we start, we like, we started to see that page turn a little bit right in the final international window in 2021 when they took the team to Australia and we saw a bunch of young players yeah. or players who hadn't been called in for some time make their return to that international window and make that trip to Australia. And then we got to see 2022, the continuity of that. So um, looking at that, she believes cup, I think it was supposed to be what, maybe folks were looking at is that kind of first test in terms of like mm -hmm. getting a look at these players all together. But I also remember that there was like, you know, there's always that, that <laughs> goofy discourse, you know, about like the teams and the competition that they're playing in front of mm -hmm. them. And when it got announced with Czech Republic and Iceland and New Zealand, um, some of the, the press conferences around there was talking about the teams that got invited to this and how there were certain teams that were lined up and scheduled to play within the 2022 edition of the C believes cup, but because of the ongoing pandemic and, and scheduling conflicts and things like that, they ended up having to reach out to other teams. And like, yeah. so this was the she believes cup that was in front of the players and they ended up, you know, taking it on and tackling it well. And, um, for all of the conversation in that discourse that took that that was surrounding some of the the opposition, they opened that she believes cup with the zero zero draw against Czech Republic, and I think that was probably the earliest part 
of some of the discourse in 2022 where it was like, what's going on with Andonovsky? These players aren't getting it together, et cetera, et cetera. There was like, I think that was like for me, like the earliest point in the year where there was a lot of that kind of, kind of discourse that continued, you know, to follow the team. Yeah throughout 2022 and then they followed it up with a pair of like april friendlies against uzbekistan and there was again the continuity of that it's like hey we had a team like the certain teams that were targeted in this window unfortunately that did not come to light we reached out like now we're playing uzbekistan and you know those were really big lopsided scores we're talking about nine like 18 goals yeah over this window in april for these for these uh you know, against these two teams. So it's like uh, folks were just saying, I think it was a mixed, you know, mixed bag of results. But I, I appreciated the She Believes Cup for what we got to see um, develop on the pitch. I think we started to see uh, Andonovsky and the coaching staff really kind of uh, center in on a trio or even a quartet of players that they wanted to see get more time together and develop that chemistry. We really mm -hmm. started to see Mallory Pugh, Sophia Smith, Katarina Macario really getting that extended time together. Rose Lavelle in the mix, trying to see how the kind of that quartet can continue to develop. And it was promising. I think all of us were uh, really excited to take mm -hmm. a look at 2022 and sort of see that trio or quartet of players throughout it. But unfortunately, um, this was also a year that was played by a lot of injury. And so because of that, we had to hit the, the brakes. It was a pause on sort of, you know, getting to, to see and watch the development between um, between certain players. And we should probably chat a bit about that because maybe 2022 for some folks could be the year of the injury. Uh, yeah, I think that's putting it lightly. There was so many uh, devastating injuries that took place in 2022. Um, and then specifically when we look at just the U.S. women's national team and some of the top talent that has been called into these camps and getting senior national team caps and then it, that they are plagued with injury. It started with Tierna Davidson, defender for the U.S., uh, also plays for Chicago Red Star is announcing that she has torn her ACL. Um, then Lynn Williams also dealing with a, a hamstring injury. Those came early in the year yeah. in March. It, it's a kind of crazy to think that we were without those two players for most of this year um, in what they were able to do. And I think that opened a lot of question marks across the back line, specifically without Tierna Davidson, because she was a namestay for Black Wanonofsky as a center back role alongside Becky Sauerbrunn, really um, it groomed to take over that center back leadership role in what she was able to do. And this now opened up a giant gaping hole in the middle of, of, the United States backline in losing Tierna Davidson. So that happened in March, also with Lynn Williams announcing her injury that she would be out for the rest of the NWSL season. That happened in March. I mean, uh, I guess one of the brightest spots is that at this point in Tierna Davidson's recovery, she is expected to be available for January camp selection. Um, so uh, this was when injuries started happening in 2022 um, and ones that are still happening up until this point, late December of 2022, um, people are always circling those teams and, and then counting down the months until the yeah. World Cup. And that's exactly what fans started doing when we heard about Davidson and Williams. And then from there, we go on to hear that star striker, Katarina Macario, who yeah. played for Lyon, uh, ends up tearing her ACL after coming off of a great She Believes Cup where we were looking at a different – front line for the United States because with Katarina Macario in that front line alongside players like Smith, Pugh, Alex Morgan, Macario added a new look playing a, a withheld nine, dropping back deeper into the midfield. So that announcement of, of her injury in June was stifling for U S women's national team fans for the teams. It, it, it was, it was like, okay, let's count. Let's count the months until we hope she could be back. Um, Black Wanonofsky has reported that she's at a, 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 the FIFA rehab center and she's expected to be back by late February from this injury. And then uh, the fourth in a, a quadruple of sad injuries, Kristen press forward, Kristen press announcing that she tore her ACL in, in June. This is her first season playing in LA with Angel City in the NWSL, 
and with the national team, um, uh, this was going to be her year, uh, right, with club and with country, finally playing back in the NWSL. And she announces that she tore her ACL. So that was another one. Fans had to count the months and say, how far until the World Cup? How long for this player to, to start their recovery and get back on the pitch? It was like one after the other. I think that was yeah. what was so jarring about the injury list in 2022 that it was just A, it was constant, and B, it was just like one after the other. I think with Williams, and although it wasn't an ACL, it's a leg, there's ligaments, right? It, it, it's ham, the ongoing hamstring injury. You've got Williams and Davidson is like back to back, like in March, and then you've got a Macario and a press that's back to back. And like, yeah. it's like the way in which these injuries were occurring, it just was like it felt constant and it just felt like one after the other. So it just feels kind of jarring and it kind of set in motion a lot. You know, again, the continuity of all the question marks right around this team. It's like, oh, and then the whole concept of like, here's another test and here's another test and, and here's this next test for this group of players throughout uh, 2022. But, you know, with the injuries, with players out on um, maternity leave, right? Because yeah, yeah. Black Odinowski, um has constantly kind of included players collectively within players who are absent from the team in 2022. It was always a combination of players who were dealing with injury or players working their way back from from maternity leave, whether that was, uh, you know, a Crystal Dunn or somebody like a Julie Ertz who has constantly been asked about in these press conferences despite – you know, no real updates um, or somebody like a Casey Kruger, who he has brought up in, in, um, in press conferences as well. So what was that going to look like in a year that held such a big moment for this team, which was the CONCACAF W championship. And I think what that did, we already started this 2022 talking about how that, that beginning turn of the page was actually flipped. And we started to see, um, you know, these real glimpse of these sort of next gen players, but that also opened the window for even more mm -hmm. of these players to sort of get into the mix, into the, the, the pool and, and conversation of players on this roster. We saw the return of Naomi Gurma with this team in 2022 after being drafted number one overall with San Diego wave. Um, it was her first time back with the senior team in camps, I believe since 2019. Um, and I think even then, I don't think people anticipated what somebody like Yerma was going to bring and provide for this team in such a state of necessity because yeah. it was necessary. It was like, what's going, like what's happening in this, in these center back positions, because we also actually didn't even mention Becky Sauerbrunn. This was a player who had um, some work done ahead of this NWSL season uh, on her right knee as well. So was out for an extended period of time. So we saw somebody like Alana Cook, right? Kind of like this last center back standing yeah. Um, in between, uh, you know, a position that kind of saw a lot of injuries, whether it was to Davidson or Sauerbrunn very early in the year or Abby Dahlkemper, who we now know was has constantly been navigating a dangerous back injury. She announced that she had uh, surgery already in 2022 during this offseason. So kind of like this combination of like, here's a lot of cooks. She's this <laughs> last center back standing and. Becky Sauerbrunn is eventually working her way back in. We've got to get some more depth in this position. And here is Naomi Gurma coming off of this outstanding, at the time, it was like a first half of her NWSL season. And they're bringing her in for these uh, these June friendlies against Colombia. Right. And uh, this was like the final prep before this team went off to Mexico to compete for a World Cup qualification spot uh, in July. I mean, even when Germa was with San Diego, it was also this big question mark around the wave and kind of how they were competing in the NWSL because yeah. no one really knew what to expect from this new expansion side with a uh, new coach and Stoney and new ownership and everything. It was brand new. So to mm -hmm. kind of watch Naomi Germa develop throughout the NWSL season and, and continue to see Vlako Anonofsky pick her out individually and, and say, we need you. And then to have such a young player as a rookie in the professional league she just graduated from Stanford then step into the uh, 
one of the most difficult positions, frankly, on mm-hmm. the soccer field as a center back because you can't make any mistakes. You have to lead the team. You have to be vocal. You have to organize everything defensively. And yeah. Germa just stepped in there seamlessly alongside Alana Cook for for most of those friendlies in June before the CONCACAF W Championship. And little did we know that that would be the future, right, of, of these center backs, of Germa being the one to step in there and solidify her spot. She rose to the occasion tremendously. And we saw that throughout the CONCACAF W Championship because the United States went into this um, – And they end up winning their ninth CONCACAF championship. Uh, They shut out all of their opponents throughout this tournament. Um, No goals against during it. They played Haiti, Jamaica, Mexico, Costa Rica. Then they end up playing Canada in the CONCACAF W championship final. And it's a 1-0 win for the United States with a goal from Alex Morgan. But we also saw some injuries throughout this tournament as well. And, And with that opened up a spot for another player and a new face because Ashley Hatch ends up getting injured in the middle of this July CONCACAF tournament, which ended up being qualifiers for the World Cup, opening up qualifiers for the Olympics and the W Gold Cup in 2024. And with that, Ashley Hatch, forward for Washington Spirit and the U.S., had to go home back to the United States to start her recovery on her back injury, which opened up the opportunity for Portland Thorns midfielder Sam Coffey, another rookie in the NWSL, to join the United States. Um, She ends up joining the team and gets 90 minutes and continues to play and and really steps into that role. So uh, early on, right, this is July of 2022. We're seeing two young, young players get their first senior caps and not only just getting caps in a couple of minutes here and there, but solidifying their spots and their roles on this team in Naomi Gurma and Sam Coffey. 100%. I think that that June window, I think, was an, a little bit of another turning point maybe for this team. And for me, July was it like July, 2022 was like a really top moment for me. I don't want to speak for you, but I know we really enjoyed, uh, you know, doing the coverage of the CONCACAF W championship. It was a real opportunity to sort of get an even deeper look at this team and how they're going to look uh, during uh, you know, a very intense kind of international tournament. Um, and that June window ahead of this tournament, getting a German in the mix, you know, a Korniak in the mix, yeah. Taylor Korniak in the mix as well, Sam Coffee in the mix. I mean, that was part of why that wasn't a like for like swab. I think that's important, you know, and that you mentioned that because you've got a, a striker in in hatch and then you've got a defensive midfielder in coffee so this wasn't a like for like swap coffee was had already been with the team at this point um in that june window but hey, she didn't play but she, she didn't, didn't play it. yeah so they were like you know what you need to come on in and, and be with the team you're you're the you're one of the, the the players that has sort of already been in this uh with this with this specific group um so sort of watching um, this team, you know, put together the performances that they did. I mean, we, watching Sophia Smith, you know, at this point in the midway of the year, kind of continue her very impressive year. Um, it was really, really cool to watch. I think there, there was so much chatter about like, we need to see this group tested and they haven't gotten a real test yet. And there was still Lisa, there was still some of that yeah. in this competition, the CONCACAF disrespect was too much for me. You know how much we love CONCACAF <laughs> and we don't want it to ever be disrespected, but there was still some of that in this competition as well. Um, you know, people saying like, oh, like what is it, you know, really to go up against the, you know, a Mexican side that struggled, you know, in, in the tournament that they hosted, you know, or or Jamaica or, uh, you know, yeah. really not getting a look until, uh, really not maybe getting tested until Canada, you know, Bologna, mm-hmm. right? Like Haiti. Bologna. Like what does Haiti look like? You know, like, so it was, it was, it was, it was very interesting time. And I loved it. It, July was probably one of my favorite months to cover this team um, during, during the year. Um, But I think it was important because like they had lost at this point, we knew that they were not going to have a Katarina Macario going into, into this. They were not going to have a Kristen press. And it also kind of was like this idea, this point in the year in which the coaching staff was like, okay, we're going to start integrating the veterans back in Uh because we saw 
Alex Morgan yeah. and Megan Rapino get yep. reintroduced to this team in 2022. And they had not been collectively called into the team since like October of 2021. So that was also a big storyline adjacent to the fact that this was a group of players who hadn't had a lot of time, um, you know, to, to play with each other throughout uh, maybe the six months that they had already been um, competing with each other. So uh, that was a very exciting time for me. And, and I know for you and for us here at, at the show and, you know, they, they followed that up with, with later friendlies in the later stage of the years. They, they had the, the couple of friendlies against Nigeria. We were very excited about that. A four zero victory. Yeah. And then a two, one victory, a little bit more narrow. We were very excited about uh, that them going up against that team as well. We, we talked a lot about what maybe those results might have looked like if Nigeria had actually also had their full squad at their disposal because they were a team at the time during that window that were also dealing with a bit of an injury bug. Um, but it set up the stage for kind of the, you know, the, the latter, the latter moments of this year. And of course, alongside those friendlies, we got to talk about this historic CBA that this team signed <laughs> during this window as well. A long time coming. I think we were celebrating it, um, you know, as the news came through uh, and, and was released, uh, the ongoing negotiations between both the United States women's national team, the U S men's national team and U S soccer to finally get this done. And the team went ahead and put, pen to paper and the collective historic CBA was was signed. It was uh, very exciting. Yeah, I mean, it, following the NWSL CBA that was signed um, at the start of the NWSL season and then having uh, the U.S. soccer CBA being signed, it was an incredible historic moment, right? Because the CBA was signed by both national teams, the men's and the women's. Um, but it, this one was specifically uh, for the women's CBA after this Nigeria match uh, that was actually played in Philadelphia at Subaru Park. And, and that was something that was super cool as well, um, because this was such a long time coming. There were so many meetings with these players, so many fights, so much um, decisions and discussions and negotiations that had to take place with this. And, and um, by doing this, they got more money for themselves. They got not just equal pay, but also equal representation. And uh, I mean, this CBA was just historic. It was the year of the CBA, <laughs> frankly, like in the domestic league, in the NWSL, and then with U.S. soccer and it, it being already put into place, right, with the Men's World Cup that just concluded this past weekend. Um, and because of that, like it, it, the overall equal pay fight saw a reckoning in September of this year with the women's team. You know, I think this is maybe the moment in the year where we can look at as sort of the feel good moments of, of the year. Um, we're talking about a team with a lot of players who maybe hadn't had a lot of time together, but they were picking up dubs, right? They were getting the wins along the way in 2022 um, the announcement of the CBA, that was very exciting. All of these players are part of a very historic moment um, for this team and its program's history. Um, and then we're, we kind of turned to, to the latter stages of, of this year where maybe it's a, we got to talk about it as, you know, perhaps it was a bit of, of a gray area, um, you know, for, for the team this year. Because right after that, you roll into October and um, – the U.S. Soccer Commission investigative report by Sally Q. Yates is, is released in early October. Um, and it essentially, you know, goes through a lot of the the, the investigation was of, of all of the allegations of, of sexual abuse and, and harassment within women's professional soccer. And it's a very, very stark report. You know, I believe it was over 300 pages. We did a ton of episodes on it. If people need a recap of that, please, um, you know, check out those summaries as well. Um, but there was a lot. Of, it was difficult, difficult report mm -hmm. to get through with all of the findings. And it dropped just ahead of another big moment for this team. They were going to go to Europe yeah, and play in an October window against England and Spain. And England, a big 
July of their own. They came out as champions of Europe. They're the Euro 2022 champions. So they were going to play in Wembley. There was a, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of, of sparkly, bright, bright things to talk about in the buildup to this game. And the report, it almost just sort of sucked the air out of that, at least in terms of this side of the pond, right? There, mm -hmm. it, was, it was just so um, disheartening and saddening to uh, to sort of go through all of that. And then we have these players in a camp overseas, yeah. right? Yeah. And we see these players, um, Becky Sauerbrunn specifically, Alana Cook specifically, we hear from Megan Rapino specifically, coming out of these camps, fielding questions about these things and you know Becky Cyber and the captain of this team saying we're just I'm just going to put it out there now because I'm going to get asked we're not okay um yeah. that it was just you know again it was just very 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 difficult um to get through all of that and I you know I think it's important for us to to take note of that in light of this window right that October window because it's it's their first two losses of the year uh, in 2022. And um, they did, I think, uh, their best to try to celebrate a very big moment in terms of two very good programs going head to head with England and, and Spain and, and, you know, mm -hmm. a massive record crowd at Wembley yep. Stadium. There was a lot to celebrate there. And I think they tried to do their best to, to take it all in. But I can't imagine what that was like to have to go through that international wow. window in light of all that dropping. Exactly. And and with the results of the Yates investigation, um, players saying that they still had to play, right? Even though there was a break in domestic play in the NWSL, the, the national team was still competing. They, they could be together, right? Which I think is also a bright spot in that, that um, they at least had each other in those moments when they were traveling and in Europe for these friendlies. But with the Yates investigation results dropping there. They also dropped recommendations for us soccer to do. Um, and one of those was creating a task force um, in, in us soccer's membership in, in order to provide safety around that. And so that dropped in early, early October, this investigation with the recommendations and, and the next steps for us soccer to take. And by December, it was announced that, um, Manishim was going to be the chair of the Participant Safety Task Force for U.S. soccer. So uh, I think it's so important to see that within two months span, right, I mean, of the results dropping and the investigation report, that Manishim, who was a very um, – uh, Per, uh, a person very much involved in this that came forward, put her face and her name to these results and, and this investigation and and was one of the handful of players that started this ball rolling about let's uncover some of these horrible things that have happened that she then becomes the chair of the participation safety task force for U.S. soccer in, in early December. So it was quickly um, turned around and, and hopefully steps being made in the right direction, right? The, I'm trying to find like the yeah, coupling the of the silver lining yeah. that comes with the devastation that was the, yeah the Yates reports, but at the same time, the U S then dropped games and a lot of fingers were pointed at this team and at black Lenanovsky about what are they doing? Um, it, playing against European champions, England, going, going to Spain and playing a game. Um, and why aren't they winning these games? Why aren't they just dominating at this point? And I think we learned a lot about the world of women's football at that point and understanding yeah. that. Yeah. It, the competition is really tight and these other nations are incredibly good and talented. And that was the preparation that I think this team needed at that point um, to, to kind of reflect on, especially being in Europe, not playing at home records, crowds at Wembley playing for the first time in Paloma, Spain against the Spanish national team. These were really big tests for the United States that they needed to have in that moment. And I think when I reflect on it now, not being so in the moment with it yeah. in October, um, it was good for this team, right? To have those yeah. challenges. Maybe the timing wasn't great yeah. coupled with the Yates report, but yeah. uh, the challenges on the pitch were good for them. Absolutely. I mean, look, we wanted to see certain things during those friendlies and I think we still got to see them. We talked a lot about how Trinity Rodman was getting, you know, call call ups in, into these national team camps and that we wanted to see her get a chance to start mm -hmm. some of these games. And uh, my goodness, I mean, 
there was a goal that was called back that, you know, she, she had scored against England. And I think we're talking about that particular game very differently if it ends in a 2-2 draw versus a 2-1 loss, which is how it went down in the record books, right? But it was such a great moment in terms of the stage that it was. And to see not just, you know, Rodman perform well, but Smith performing well, um, I think it it provided a, a different level of excitement around some of the younger players that maybe folks weren't, um, hadn't reached yet in, in those beginning uh, matches of, of the year, right? It was different watching this type of talent go up against, you um, these these sort of top ranked teams versus you know against like in Uzbekistan um so there was a different energy i think coming out of these friendlies despite the the two consecutive losses it ended a streak for this team right 71 home game uh unbeaten streak that was ended when they came back in november and went up against germany i don't know if anybody had planned or you know predicted in 2022 that the United States women's team national team would go on a three game losing streak. But that also happened in 2022, a couple of friendlies against Germany, both two, one score lines, one, which they dropped against Germany. And then the other, they closed out their calendar year with a victory mm -hmm. two one. I liked these friendlies. They I were tough to get through, but they were fun to watch. These friendlies were incredibly fun to watch. I mean, the talent that this German side had and, and the mm -hmm. questions that they posed to the United States um, and the fact that they did lose that opening match against Germany going on that three game skid and then the first loss at home. Um, I think to then follow it up with a two one win with goals from Smith and Pew in, in that match in New Jersey at Red Bull, it was the way for this team to finish the year. They they still conceded one to Germany in that in that match, but um the turnaround and the difference between these two games and and what these players were able to do, the the type of competition that we saw. I mean, this was a, a top five team in Germany, right? That's exactly who the United States needs to be playing. Those are the question marks that they can be posed. And we saw them make changes and adjustments from the first game to the second game. Um, we saw a little bit more fight and a little bit more grit from the United States team to close out the year in this match against Germany. And that's how they did it because they end on a win. Um, they, they ended with some announcements for the 2023 year, but these November friendlies against Germany back in the United States were a, a way for them to kind of close out this year and put a stamp on it with a win over Germany 2-1 and then turn the page to 2023, a World Cup year, um, and what they're going to bring because the competition is is not slowing down. And now that they face those tests against England, Spain, Germany, um, they can continue to, to plow forward and understand the growth because all the injuries we talked about, those players are also coming back. And they've been watching all year. They saw what happened against Germany. They saw what happened against England and Spain. Um, so adding those pieces back in after they, they close out with a loss and a win over Germany is a, an interesting way to end the year. Maybe not the way that the U.S. wanted to end it, the way that fans didn't want it to end that way, but they end on a win. They end on a high note, and I think that's something to to circle and put a star around. Absolutely, 100%. I, um, I'm with you. I love that the World Cup is, is what's – on the radar for this team it was on the radar in 2022. And now as they are looking ahead to 2023, it's absolutely the biggest thing on the list.